Yeah, perfect. You're good to go now. OK, great. Uh, welcome back. So we are now on the photo acoustic session. We've had several very exciting sessions uh, so far and uh, I have great hopes for this. Uh, we have a wonderful group of people, including uh, Professor Paul Beard, uh, Ben Cox and um, Sarah Bondiak. So uh, you've all seen their lectures, I hope, at this point, and I'm going to hand you over to Paul Beard, who's going to just give a quick reminder on what he's talked about, and then we'll go to some of these questions. So over to you, Paul. OK, thank you, Martin. Uh, can you see my can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see a slide short uh, sorter. OK, so you should see the title slide now. OK, uh, so my talk, um, if you viewed it, uh, was concerned with uh, describing the basic physical principles of photoacoustic imaging uh, and the types of instruments that are used to implement it. So just very briefly, um, I covered the historical context, the motivation for it, uh, and the underlying physics, and went on to talk about the sort of lasers and detectors that are used. So just, I'm sorry, that's the wrong presentation. Let me try that again. Okay, so just very briefly, the motivation for it um, is to avoid the penetration depth and spatial resolution limitations uh, due to scattering uh, that optical imaging techniques suffer from. So the idea is to uh, encode optical contrast onto sound waves, which are scattered much less than photons. Um, and the expectation is then one can get optical contrast uh, with spectroscopic selectivity, as you do with optical imaging techniques, with the sort of high resolution deep tissue uh, spatial resolution that you get with ultrasound imaging. So I went through the basic transduction mechanism, uh, how photoacoustic signals are generated, uh, and used to reconstruct an image with this diagram here showing the signals recorded by an ultrasound detector uh, or rather an array of detector uh, and described a back projection process for reconstructing the image um, give you a sense of, um, of the principles underlying that. Uh, so I then moved on to discussing what a photoacoustic image represents. The reconstructed image uh, represents the absorbed energy distribution. Uh, so contrast, we say, tends to be defined by optical absorption. Um, and that makes it suitable for imaging a range of chromophores, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin are probably the most important. That's why photoacoustic images tend to show blood vessels. Uh, melanin is another source of contrast, which shows the retinal pigmented epithelium in the eye. Uh, and at longer wavelengths, absorption by lipids can be exploited, for example, to image atheromas as plaque. I talked a bit about penetration depth and spatial resolution. So the former is limited by optical and acoustic attenuation in tissue. Um, and it's possible to get several centimeter penetration depths by appropriate choices of wavelength. Uh, and spatial resolution, well, this is ultimately defined by frequency dependent attenuation. So scales with penetration depth that one can get penetration uh, resolutions of the order of a few hundred microns for centimetre scale penetration depths, 10 to 100 microns for sub-centimetre depth. And I then spoke a bit about the requirements for the ultrasound detector for receiving photoacoustic signals. The critical challenge is getting high enough sensitivity. The combination of uh, acoustic and optical attenuation means that we end up with very weak signals being detected by the detector. And photoacoustic signals are also broadband um, and obtaining detectors that will provide that combination of very broad bandwidth and we also need small element size and spacing for high spatial resolution as a challenge. I then moved on to discussing a range of imaging instruments, um, small animal and clinical systems, so possibly the most common implementation for clinical imaging is to use a standard clinical ultrasound probe and bring the light in around it. Uh, and use the linear array of the ultrasound probe to record photoacoustic signals and to do pulse circular ultrasound at the same time. Uh, and then I covered a few other uh, detection geometries for imaging the breast, a planar detection geometry, uh, and a hemispherical detection geometry, which a number of groups are uh, investigating. 
Uh, finally, uh, there's a whole range of endoscopic devices that have been developed um, for imaging, for example, uh, coronary artery disease or internal organ imaging. Uh, and then finally, there are the microscopy modes, acoustic resolution photoacoustic microscopy, which involves scanning a focus detector over the surface of the tissue. Um, and then there's the optical resolution mode, which uses a focused interrogation beam to provide optical diffraction limited lateral resolution, so it can provide much higher resolution than the other modes of photoacoustic imaging, albeit only to a depth of a millimetre or so, as it relies on unscattered photons to form the image. OK, so that's a very quick overview of what I covered in the talk, um, and I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Paul. So the, the first question to Paul is uh, from the intro lecture slide 34. What is the advantage of photoacoustic microscopy over side stream dark field microscopy when imaging individual red blood cells? Uh, so I'm assuming with this question that dark stream microscopy is pure light microscopy. Um, I see. I can't actually see the questions at the moment. Uh, okay. Um, is it actually what? What was the type of microscopy? Uh, side stream dark field microscopy. Th this is the technique, if I understand correctly, is uh, where you illuminate from the sides with um, uh, with green light, and then you see the blood vessels as a shadow. It's so it's it's kind of an extension of of um, traditional. Um, live microscopy or um, in vitro, what we call in vitro microscopy, I guess, looking at, at blood vessels, uh, just looking using green light, but um, uh, a bit like your your um, photoacoustic microscope where you're illuminating from the sides uh, using a kind of a, a conical lens or something like that. So dark field illumination. So it shows up the vessels. Um, I guess that, that with photoacoustic microscopy, you're you're going to get uh, a resolution which is somehow the convolution of both the the optical resolution and the photoacoustic uh, resolution. Uh, so, if the vessels are close to the surface, maybe it doesn't matter which one you use. Possibly, photoacoustic microscopy would see a little bit deeper. Um, especially if it's using a longer wavelength of light, maybe up to a millimeter. I suspect that uh, this side stream dark field microscopy uh, is, is very limited in its depth. I, I believe it's been developed by people like Can Ince and others in Belgium and uh, the Netherlands. So that there's even a company around that. OK. Uh, do you want to add something to that or should we move to the next question? Uh, I, I think that's a pretty good answer. I'll, I'll just add it depends on the mode of photoacoustic microscopy. If it's acoustic resolution microscopy, um, then uh, it's very likely you'd get greater penetration depth as you're not limited by um, the um, uh, ballistic photon uh, uh, depth. Um, if it's optical resolution, um, that, that that probably wouldn't apply and you get a similar penetration depth as with the uh, pure light microscopy technique. OK, Julian uh, Tampu at Linköping wants to know um, the initial pressure distribution is described as the product between the Gernison coefficient and the absorption and fluids. Uh, can you discuss why the thermomechanical conversion factor is not space dependent? Uh, well, the first thing to say is it is spatially dependent. Um, we know that the thermodynamic properties of, of tissue are not homogeneous, um, and it's the uh, it's really the question of um, the extent to which those properties vary. Um, and um, of course, we know they vary. And if they didn't, uh, pure ultrasound imaging wouldn't work. Um, but the variation in the Grunlinsen coefficient is relatively modest. Um, at least compared to the variation in optical properties, uh, which also defines image contrast. Um, so we don't completely neglect the Grunizing coefficient. Um, it, it, it is a factor, um, but it's one that um, 
is, is thought not to be particularly significant. Certainly, as I say, the contrast, uh, optical contrast uh, provided by different tissues um, is, is, is significantly greater. So, for example, blood, uh, the absorption coefficient of, of blood compared to um, uh, molecules surrounding blood vessels um, is uh, orders of magnitude, well, maybe as much as an order of magnitude higher, whereas grunizing coefficient variations we tend to think of the order of a few percent, but it does depend on the on the nature of the tissue. That's for soft tissue. Okay, that that's a very good practical answer. the The penetration depth is very high at seven hundred nanometers. May I know what are the factors that determine it? Are they only the tissue optical properties, namely absorption and scattering coefficients, or are there more factors? Uh, if the question is why is it uh, higher at 700 nanometers in, in particular, um, it, it is the, the, the tissue properties, um, particularly the absorption um, properties of the tissue um, that result in that higher penetration depth than at other wavelengths. So I think this is referring to the, the figure I showed of um, uh, optical penetration depth as a function of wavelength. Um, uh, but more generally, penetration depth also depends on the extent to which the acoustic wave is attenuated by the tissue. OK, um, so uh, that was from Barcelona. This one is from UT in the Netherlands, uh, also to Paul. So in slide 29 of your intro, do the movement artifacts distort the photoacoustic images obtained in the handheld mode? It all depends on the <coughs> excuse me. All, all depends on the frame rate of the imaging system. Uh, so for the handheld probe systems I showed in the talk, um, well at least one of them was a regular clinical ultrasound probe, um, which will provide real time ultrasound images um, that a frame rate at which movement artifacts uh, are not significant in most cases. Uh, and I believe the photoacoustic image frame rate was similar. So no, I wouldn't expect artifacts to be a particular problem with that system. I think okay. also, that I sh sorry, I was just going to add, that I did show another system which used um, a 2D array rather than a linear array um, that the other system used. Um, but even that, I think, had a frame rate of about 5 hertz. So it depends what you're looking at. If you're putting the probe on the tissue surface and moving it around and looking at relatively static objects. I wouldn't expect that to cause significant movement after that. OK, Adon Brenock wants to know um, what are the PA applications? Uh, sorry, what PA applications are there for using other endogenous chromophores besides blood, melanin, lipids and water, e.g. collagen, bilirubin, beta carotene as biomarkers for specific diseases? And also Sarah could chip in on this. Shall I come in on that one first? Sure, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, so um, there's been quite a number of other applications that have been demonstrated beyond just the haemoglobin, which was the focus of most of the uh, presentations that you've seen. So one example uh, from the collagen perspective is a paper published by Ferdinand Nierling's group from Erlingen um, just last year in Nature Medicine. They used collagens as an imaging biomarker for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a muscle wasting disease, which is often uh, afflicting pediatric patients. So in this disease, they want to be able to evaluate the extent of muscular degeneration. And what they were able to show is uh, both in uh, animal models and in patients that imaging collagen using photoacoustics gives you a non-invasive way of evaluating the extent of the disease. And they really highlighted that as a way to provide an age independent biomarker which would allow you to potentially um, look at therapeutic response in these patients and see whether new therapies that are being applied could help with uh, regeneration or prevention of uh, muscular degeneration. So that's one really interesting application for the collagen related biomarkers. There's also been quite an extensive amount of work. So that was just one sort of one paper as an example, but there's been quite an extensive history of work looking at lipids in the context of atherosclerosis and characterizing plaques forming in the uh, blood vessels. 
And that's been uh, done quite a lot in the context of using intravascular photoacoustics, which is a tool that uh, Paul highlighted in um, his presentation. So there have been developments looking at the ability of photoacoustics using the longer wavelengths, so particularly in the range from about 950 up to about 1300 nanometers and the various lipid related peaks in that range and using those to characterize um, individual uh, plaques and with the idea of essentially being able to predict plaque rupture um, and also um, un understanding the severity of the disease. And so having that kind of biochemically specific information has been shown to be very useful uh, in that particular application as well. So that's an example coming from the lipids. I think melanin is probably one of the kind of the oldest uh, applications beyond blood just because um, the use of uh, photoacoustics to characterize depth of lesions on the skin based on melanin has been shown to be useful for uh, evaluating potential um, melanocytic lesions and um, particularly in the cases of melanoma. And there's been quite a body of work in the literature on that as well. So I think there are quite a lot of other biomarkers that we can use in photoacoustics. Of course, we pointed out that haemoglobin has a lot of advantageous properties, but indeed for a range of different diseases, collagens, lipids, melanin and other optical absorbers have been shown to be, be useful. That's great. Uh, so, uh, Paul, did you want to add anything or should we move to the next question? Just very briefly on the um, sources of contrast in the brackets in that question, um, collagen, bilirubin and beta carotene. Um, uh, there has been some work recently published on uh, that suggests that um, that uh, collagen can be detected directly with uh, photoacoustics, although that's pretty challenging because the absorption spectrum uh, overlaps with water. Uh, I know there's been a microscopy study um, to visualize bilirubin distributions, um, but done a very short wavelength. So I think this would only have a penetration depth of a millimeter or so. Beta carotene is an interesting one that were well, personally interesting one. Um, when I started in photoacoustics uh, doing my PhD, um, we were trying to visualize uh, atheromatous plaques uh, by targeting the beta carotene, uh, which has a strong absorption band in the blue part of the spectrum. Um, that's, since all those many years ago, I haven't really come across any other any suggestions of using it. So it's an interesting one to bring up. OK, thank you both. Um, uh, Binju in uh, Boston wants to know, does photoacoustic tomography have a speckle effect? And if it does, what factors affect the visibility of the PA speckle? So maybe there could be two speckle effects. <laughs> all right. Um, that's a, a really interesting question. How long have we got? Um, We'd need most of the Q&A to go get into that one, wouldn't we? That, that's right. Um, let me see if I can do it justice. Um, Succinct answer, please. <laughs> in, a, in a concise way. Um, so photoacoustic imaging, certainly in the tomography mode, is a coherent imaging technique, like ultrasound, like OCT. So you would expect that speckle would form. Um, and I think that's a, a fair um, expectation. Um, and the question is, we don't seem to see very obvious speckle effects in most photoacoustic images um, in the way that we do, say, with an ultrasound image. Um, and there's some debate as to, as to why that is. Um, one reason is that in ultrasound imaging, um, the, the system is essentially fairly narrow band. You tend to emit tone bursts, um, which have a relatively narrow frequency spectrum. Um, uh, and the implication of that is that, um, that you have significant coherence um, in the system um, and you need coherence to produce speckle. Now, in photoacoustic imaging, the signal tends to be more broadband. Um, and if it's broadband, that implies that the, um, the signal are, uh, have lower coherence. And so it might be that, that that is why we're not always seeing speckle in the most obvious way. 
Um, there are other differences in the way photoacoustic and ultrasound images are reconstructed, uh, and that might also have an effect. Um, it's true, though, that if you look at some photoacoustic images that are produced using a conventional clinical ultrasound scanner, you do see sort of blob type features that seem to be reminiscent of speckle. Um, and that might be because those transducers are relatively narrow band compared to some of the transducers used in photoacoustic imaging. So, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. Uh, so Samana in Adigfo in Spain uh, wants to know the major sources of error in photoacoustic imaging and can you briefly tell us how they're being addressed? Um, it, I guess it depends on what, what we mean by sources of, of, of error. Um, I think I'm going to interpret that as um, inaccuracies in the reconstructed image. Um, so uh, these relate to the, the way the signals are detected. So I think the first thing that the detector needs to be is broadband, as I've said. Um, and if it's not, if it doesn't capture, for example, the high frequencies, then spatial resolution is going to be degraded and the image will look blurred. That's pretty obvious. What's less obvious is if you don't capture the low frequencies, you can end up effectively high pass filtering the images so you only see the edges of structures and that's a very common artifact that you see in photoacoustic images particularly with piezoelectric detectors and i think i've provided an example of that in the talk um, another important source uh, of artifact uh, relates to the so-called limited view problem to reconstruct an image exactly you really need to be able to capture the acoustic wave field um uh over a, over a sphere so over, over a four pi solid angle in practice that's pretty difficult to do you might be able to do it with a mouse but there's not much else you can do do it with um so in most cases we have a for example a an array maybe a planar or a linear array of limited extent we're only capturing part of the wave field uh, and the effect of that is to produce back projection, is to produce artifacts in the image. And you normally see those as sort of wing-like features when you're looking at the cross section of something like a blood vessel. Okay, um, to what extent do distortions like uh, variations in speed of sound and things like that impact? And, you know, is there an extent to which I think we see in the, in the medical user community with ultrasound, for example, that people, just believe what's in the image and uh, just ignore the fact that they're that this is a distorted image or maybe just don't even um, consider that as a possibility. Um, they just assume that this is an actual image with the dimensions being exactly as they are presented. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, uh, so, so two things to say about uh, image distortion. So due to sound speed heterogeneities, um, yes, that can be significant. And certainly we've tried um, imaging through a few centimeters of a mouse um, using a very high fidelity broadband system uh, and find basically the signal gets scrambled to the extent that you can't really reconstruct an image beyond uh, at that sort of depth. Um, so that's certainly significant and something to be aware of. Um, I think the other thing I would say is to be aware of um, the way the light fluence is distributed. Um, when you look at a photoacoustic image, it's a representation of the absorbed optical energy distribution. Um, and so, for example, features can get shadowed by more superficial structures, um, or you can get scattering that somehow corrupts the image. So you need to be thinking about the way the light's distributed as well. Okay, Meng Li at Lund wants to know how do you keep the laser at eye safety level if you perform PAT imaging near the eye and will the scattered laser light in the tissue damage the eye? So I'm assuming this is the situation where you might have a, a probe that you wanted to put onto the face um, and we're worried about light being somehow scattered from the probe onto the eye. Um, I mean, we do those sort of studies ourselves, um, and 
uh, obviously covering the eyes, the most obvious thing to do. Um, I suppose in some cases you could imagine light somehow being transmitted and scat scattered through the tissue, possibly through the back of the eye or something like that. Um, that sounds like a very weak effect, but I suppose it's something that would need to be uh, simulated and modeled to really understand. OK, Bingju in Boston again wants to know in uh, lecture slide 20 why small element size spacing should be smaller than 100 microns, because many commercial ultrasound probes has 0.1 or 0.3 uh, millimeter spacing. Does that mean the commercial ultrasound probe is not a good choice for PA imaging? OK, so the uh, answer to this is um, that the element size and spacing uh, depends on, to some extent, the, the penetration depth range that you're interested in. Uh, so that figure of 100 microns was just given an, as an example that for the case where um, you're interested in imaging features at, say, a depth of less than about a centimetre. Um, um, and at those depths, um, relatively high frequencies in the maybe the 10 to 20 megahertz range are being generated. Um, and so you need your, your detector size to be small compared to the acoustic wavelength that corresponds to those frequencies. Um, and that's where the, the figure of, I think in the slides, of a few tens of microns would be needed. In other words, at least less than 100 microns for that depth range. So that's for element size. Uh, and, and you need the element size to be small so it's omnidirectional so that you can capture the acoustic waves coming in um, from a large range of angles. Um, and that's also needed for, to reconstruct the image accurately. In terms of spacing, um, that's defined by the requirement to satisfy spatial Nyquist. So again, it depends on the, the frequency. Um, and again, for that depth range, um, it's necessary to have spacings on the scale of a few tens of microns. I'm being vague here because it does depend on um, what frequencies are generated. Um, and the reality is you're going to get very high frequencies very close to the surface um, and lower frequencies further away. Um, generally, we make a compromise um, with our systems uh, and, and, and choose a, a, a specific depth range rather than trying to capture um, uh, all length scales up to a particular depth. Okay, thank you, Paul. I have some questions for Ben now. Um, so Ben, uh, how does the structural barriers and heterogeneities uh, going to be addressed while using proximal grad approach with deep learning? Hi, um, so I assume the question means if you've got some sound speed variations or something in the tissue that's scattering the photoacoustic signal, how do you incorporate it in the image reconstruction? Um, so that's going to be a deterministic effect and the, the waves are going to be being distorted. So you need to know what the sound speed distribution is if you want to incorporate it. And then what you would do is you would incorporate it in the forward model. So for example, in the in a model based inversion, which may or may not have some element of deep learning, you would need to have the known sound speed in the forward model. So one approach is that people often do is they use an, an, another modality like ultrasound tomography to try and estimate the sound speed in order to be able to incorporate it. OK, very good. Um, also for Ben, um, Ashwini and uh, Linchibing, I guess, again, also wants to know, um, considering the movements and almost unknown vasculature in the tissue, would these learned priors be enough for the fitting uh, or fluence correction? So I think the question is asking, can we do, is it asking, can we do uh, correcting for the fluence using deep learning? Um, yeah, does the model still work, I suppose, if you have so much variation? And I suppose this depends a bit on, on the depth and exactly. Uh, I, so I mean, with, with any deep learning approach, uh, how accurate it's going to be is going to depend on your training set. So if you've got a situation where you can uh, either simulate accurately or make lots and lots of measurements um, with a known ground truth um, then that you can use to train your network then maybe maybe it could be helpful um, but it, it, it shifts the difficulty from um, 
the sort of building an accurate Ford model of light fluence to taking lots of accurate data to build a training set when you look at the deep learning approach. So I know it's very fashionable, but it's not necessarily a panacea. So when you say lots of measurements, can you clarify that? Because one could take that as being lots of measurements on a model of the, uh, you know, a tissue model with a certain vascular architecture, or it could be lots and lots of images of real uh, in vivo situations with lots of different architectures. Yeah, so that's that's what you'd want. You, you, you want lots of examples taken from the same kind of distributions that you would expect to see in practice so that you can train the network to see what sort of effects might happen. Um, right, but not training it over and over again with different views from, of the same architecture. Well, if that's, the one, if that's the one you're going to do your experiment on, then yeah, great. <laughs> if that's the only one, yeah. If you're taking it into the field, I guess that's, a, that's yeah. an issue. Um, Hempus uh, Munyford uh, from Lund wants to know um, when you mention that there is a need for short pulses in photoacoustics, why is this the case and what happens if the pulses are too long? I think that was directed at Paul, but I guess Ben could answer it. Yeah, I can answer that one. So if you do a long, uh, if, as the pulses get longer, the, the acoustic pressure is just, is just lower. Um, so you, you no longer have what stress confinement. So one way of thinking about it perhaps is if, if you, as you, as you put in the, as the heat, as the, as the optical energy gets thermalized and converts into pressure, the, the, the acoustic pressure wave will start propagating away from the region where you're depositing it. Now, if you keep on adding pressure quickly enough, it kind of builds up. So you end up with a, a significant acoustic pressure that you can actually measure. Um, if you put in your energy, the same amount of energy over a longer time, then the pulse will spread out and it will be very weak. So that's, the, that's the principal reason for having a short, a short pulse. So the short have, pulse makes the tissue vibrate and a longer pulse will just warm up the tissue, I guess. Well, it doesn't make it vibrate. It's more that it's more that the the the, the um, energy is deposited before the tissues have time to start relaxing mechanically. Um, okay. So it builds up a pressure without any volumetric change. And so you get a big pressure and then it propagates out. Um, so e even the, the if there's two timescales to consider. One, which is that timescale related to the acoustic pressure wave propagating out from the heated region, which is sometimes called stress confinement. And then there's a much longer timescale, which is that the, where the heat would start to significantly flow, which is called thermal confinement. Now, if, you, if you're on such a long timescale that thermal confinement doesn't hold, then you need to, then you need to calculate not only the, how the acoustic pressure is changing, but it'll be coupled with a temperature variation. So you can no longer use the standard photoacoustic wave equation. You'd have coupled equations for temperature and pressure. But normally we're not in that regime. Okay, question for Paul. Uh, can we use this technique to detect the temperature of cells? And if yes, uh, with what precision? Uh, there are methods of um, monitoring temperature using photoacoustic methods. Um, uh, and these generally work by exploiting the temperature dependence of the, the grunizing coefficient. So that's a case where one's actually exploiting contrast from that parameter. Um, in terms of the, I think the key thing here would be the resolute, the temperature resolution that can be achieved. Um, I could make a guess at that, but Ben, do you have a, an idea is I know you're, you're working on a technique um, for measuring temperature. I, I would imagine a few degrees, not much better than that. Yeah, I would have thought, yeah, I would have thought it'd be difficult to get better than say a tenth of a degree with, uh, with these techniques, simply because the grunizing coefficient is, is not particularly sensitive. Depending. OK, uh, well, that, that's quite a difference, though, a, a, a tenth of a degree versus a few degrees. It, I guess these are in different situations, maybe. I, I was imagining the sort of, yes, best case scenario. Um, in in a controlled sort of engineering environment versus a messy biological living animal. I think, well, even, not even necessarily a messy, a sort of messy animal, but as you, if you're sort of heating a region, you're going to change the mechanical properties of it. So you're going to slightly change the photoacoustic image. So it, it's all a bit tangled up. The images are going to be a bit uh, wrong. So I think it's quite a tricky problem to try and extract temperature. I mean, there are some papers on it. So. 
But I guess if you were just trying to measure the temperature of a sort of a very localized region, a clump of cells or something, by looking at the the single photoacoustic signal detected from that region rather than reconstructing an image. Um, right, that might be that, easier. That, if, that might be an easier best case scenario. So if you've got a very tight laser spot doing a bit of heating and you're trying to... Yeah, sure, okay. Um, then, but then you would just need to know how does the Grunerism change with the temperature for that particular t tissue, I guess. The next one is to Paul or Sarah. Um, Anant in Augsburg wants to know where does the current state of photoacoustic, or uh, well, I guess what is the current state uh, of photoacoustics for endoscopy, and what are the challenges, and which applications do you think are the low-hanging fruit? Uh, okay, shall I take a stab at that first? Um, sure. I'm just trying to find the question again. Um, I guess I would see the, the primary challenge um, is really an engineering one on, on the hardware side, particularly. Um, really trying to be able to develop highly miniaturized probes, um, again, integrating broadband detectors at the tip um, and a light delivery system is it's pretty challenging, but on the other hand, there's quite a lot of prior work that's been done in a similar field in ultrasound imaging that can be borrowed. In many cases, the same types of probes can be adapted. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a sort of intricate miniaturization engineering problem, um, I would say. Um, in terms of applications, the low hanging fruit, um, yeah, that's a difficult one because there's wide range of endoscopic applications that have been proposed. I, I tend to think maybe the, the the more tractable ones are rather than looking for diagnostic applications or applications that require on require precisely characterizing tissue, which is a, a trying to distinguish between a, a tumor and normal tissue, maybe applications where you're guiding a surgical procedure and trying to avoid um, Trying to avoid damaging blood vessels, for example, might be might be something that's um, more amenable uh, in the first instance. Yeah, I would tend to agree uh, with that, Paul. That um, maybe the more kind of the more challenging ones from the hardware perspective, I suppose, because that's probably more miniaturization towards an intravascular application rather than perhaps a gastrointestinal application, where the hardware can be a lot larger. But I think the potential gains from using photoacoustics in that realm are probably a lot higher. In the gastrointestinal space, you're competing with a rather advanced high resolution white light endoscopy. And there's been quite a lot of work using optical coherence tomography and other kind of all optical depth resolve techniques in the uh, endoscopy space for the gastrointestinal tract, which while they've shown lots of promise on the research setting, haven't found so much traction clinically and I think part of that is the existing clinical training being, you know, people are used to looking at forward views down a lumen and typically the depth resolved images are then very hard to interpret for the majority of endoscopists who are not research grade endoscopists who are used to working with novel imaging technologies. So the pathway to adoption is perhaps more challenging in a space where you're trying to replace a forward viewing probe with a, um, a depth resolved probe that looks outwards. Um, maybe more a side looking probe. I think that can be a lot more challenging. I would say there probably are, are applications where, for example, um, in the in the lungs and for endobronchial imaging, where ultrasound is currently used and the addition of photoacoustics might actually add um, some further value. But I completely agree with Paul's point. I think the diagnostic applications are probably going to be more challenging in the endoscopic space, but there's quite substantial advantages that could be gained in the therapeutic space. Um, and I think that's, I would agree that that's probably where the low hanging fruit would be. Okay, Adon is going to take over asking questions now. So over to you, Adon. Maybe your microphone is muted. Shall I ask the next one while we're sorting that out? Evelyn from uh, the uh, 
Uh, Mathian student Moscow wants to know what are the latest. Oh, sorry, did I just ask that question? Maybe I did. Um, uh, no, you haven't asked that. I didn't. Have I not? <laughs> OK, let's go back. Uh, what are the latest techniques that have shown good results in increasing beam penetration in photoacoustics? Yeah, this is a sort of an important topic. Um, so for non-invasive imaging, we, we always want to get deeper. Um, and part of addressing that is, is how to get the light deeper. Um, so and there's a combination of things that can be done to optimize the situation. Um, delivering as much light as possible, um, of course, uh, within the uh, maximum permitted exposure limits um, is an important starting point. Um, choosing the right wavelength is critical. Um, and it's generally been thought that the sort of 750 to 850 nanometer range is, is optimal uh, in that respect. Um, but there has been some work done that suggests that maybe using longer wavelengths, maybe around 1064 nanometers, which, which coincides with the neodymium YAG laser fundamental, um, might be able to improve upon that. And that's kind of slightly counterintuitive in the sense that water absorption is quite strong in that wavelength range. Um, so you might expect penetration depth to be less, um, but the maximum permitted exposure skin is significantly higher. So if you have a big enough laser, you can irradiate with a higher pulse energy, and it may be possible, it's been suggested, to get greater penetration depths in that wavelength range. Of course, that does bring up the question of contrast, because, for example, in the global absorption um, is, is much lower than it is at shorter wavelengths around there. Um, so that's one possibility. I suppose another more speculative approach is to think about ways of wavefront shaping the incident uh, excitation line. Uh, so this is means we're using methods of controlling the phase and amplitude um, of the light somehow, perhaps with a spatial light modulator, uh, in order to try to confine it at, at depth. Um, and so there's been some work done in that area, uh, and that's been suggested a way of getting greater penetration depth. OK, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll move on to the next question then. Uh, so to Ben, um, can variations in the speed of sound or tissue density be incorporated into uh, photoacoustic reconstruction algorithms? So yes, uh, the first thing to say is um, it's better if you know what they are. Um, and then what you would do is you put them in a forward model. So it wouldn't be any, you, you couldn't use, um, for example, some analytical back projection uh, algorithm because it's it's set up with a single sound speed. It assumes a single sound speed. But if you had a model based approach, which might be, for example, uh, when you've got a, if you've got a fairly small setup and you're building the full matrix, you could incorporate the sound speed into that. Or, um, I mean, we could incorporate it in K-Way, for example, when we do it. Um, and use some iterative reconstruction algorithm. Uh, one thing that um, I've seen people increasingly do is if the, if they have an object in a basin of water, they in their in their model, they determine where the boundary is between the water and the and the object, and then they can have two different sound speeds, and that can help quite a bit. So if you've got, for example, a breast imaging, you've got a breast in a bowl of water, and you know where the the boundary is between the water and the breast, you could have different sound speeds within the breast and in the water. Um, a, a sort of more, if if you want to try and reconstruct, so sort of getting the other end of the scale, if you want to try and reconstruct um, from just photoacoustic measurements, the sound speed and the photoacoustic image, certainly the, 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 there'll be some information in the photoacoustic data about the sound speed heterogeneities. And this is a question that some people have looked at, whether you can jointly reconstruct, if you've got enough data, jointly reconstruct two images, one of the sound speed and one of the uh, initial acoustic pressure and that's been shown to be unstable in other words you can't do it but it's been suggested that it's it, you can stabilize it with just a few measurements of from an ultrasound tomography sort of setup um I, i've only seen that done in simulation i think um but it's it's certainly that's at the cutting edge of what we're trying to do so in, in that case you wouldn't necessarily need to do a full ultrasound tomography to get the sound speed or the density 
um, you might be able to get away with with a, a few number of sound speed measurement of, of ultrasound tomography measurements and incorporate in a joint reconstruction with the photoacoustic data. Um, but that, I mean, that's not something that's practically ready to be used. That's um, that's something at the front edge of research. Okay. Next question is to Paul. Um, you stated that altering the shape and pulse duration of the laser diodes has a signal processing advantage. Can you elaborate on, on the advantages? Um, yes. Um, so I meant it slightly more broadly than that. Um, so um, adjusting the, the, the temporal characteristics of the laser output in general. Um, so, um, with respect to the shape and pulse duration, um, if we think about pulse duration, um, if we use an extremely short pulse duration, um, a very broadband signal will be generated um, using pulses on a nanosecond time scale. The, the frequency content at the source um, the absorber at depth in tissue could extend well into the high tens of megahertz, maybe even over 100 megahertz. Um, and the problem with that is that you're really putting energy into generating frequencies that are going to be very strongly attenuated. Um, uh, and so one possibility that's being suggested is to use a longer pulse duration um, and put more of the energy into the uh, low frequency content of the signal. Um, the aim of improving SNR. Um, so there's been suggestions of controlling effectively the acoustic bandwidth of the signal that's generated. Uh, maybe also sort of tailoring the bandwidth as well uh, to match the detector characteristics so one could shape the pulse in such a way uh, to achieve that. Uh, the other thing that's um, worth considering is instead of using just a single pulse to generate the photoacoustic signal is to use coded excitation schemes such as those where you emit um, a train of pulses um, uh, and effectively what you're doing is spreading out the energy over time. Um, now this is relevant particularly for laser diodes because um, they have uh, a fairly low damage threshold um, uh, they're, they're damaged by high peak intensity pulses and so there's, an, there's a peak power limit to them um, and it can be beneficial then to use these coded excitation schemes. As I say, you spread the energy out over a longer time um, to improve SNR. Okay, Dominic in Switzerland wants to know from Paul Beard, uh, you mentioned for diode lasers that the catastrophic optical damage peak power limit uh, you mentioned in slide 18, is this effect comparable to the damage threshold? Can you explain in more detail what happened at the laser surface when reaching this power level? And you mentioned the pulse energy of 100 microjoules for a single diode laser. Could this be overcome or are there laser diodes overcoming this value? Uh, yes, the, the, the COD, the, the catastrophic optical damage, um, limit is a, is a damage threshold. It's, it's the point at which the, the facets of the of the laser diode become damaged. Um, in terms of the underlying optical interactions, um, I'm a semiconductor physicist, so um, my guess is it would be related to defects in the um, in the laser diode crystal um, that contribute to that. Um, Beyond that, I probably can't say too much. Um, in terms of the pulse energy limit, uh, so of around about 100 microjoules, um, yeah, that's based on commercially available devices. That seems to be the sort of pulse energies that uh, can be achieved um, even if you overdrive a, a laser diode. Um, Could this be overcome? Um, well, again, it depends if this um, damage threshold can be addressed. It, it feels like it's a, a fairly fundamental limit in that we haven't seen it change um, significantly over the last decade or so, certainly with the sort of laser diodes that, that could be used uh, for photoacoustic signal generation. Um, one thing that has been done sort of slightly prosaically is to develop 
quite efficient ways of combining multiple laser diodes, so stacking them into bars. And uh, as I think I mentioned in the talk, Quantel have done this um, and produced some really quite high pulse energies now um, from those arrays of laser diodes into the mini dual regime. Whether or not they're still limited by that damage threshold I mentioned, or that's been improved with the laser diodes they're using or not, I, I don't know. Okay, um, maybe Adon is going to take over or Seren. Yeah, I, I can take over. So, uh, Marta Sam has asked, and this is to everybody, how to control temperature when doing a very sensitive PA experiment. I guess he wants to know how important it is and, and um, what would you do about it? <clears throat> I'm not sure what he means. But. Um. Well, there's a couple of aspects, I suppose. One is the, you know, how does that? It's, it's not very clear. I don't think what he means. Instrumentation oh. itself, but but also it's important to to consider in any kind of uh, imaging of a live subject that uh, you know good practice would be, uh, and Sarah probably has better information on this, or either of you guys, uh, to have the subject in the environment for 20 minutes before you start imaging. Uh, this is just because, you know, we all react to temperature, blood flow and all kinds of things change uh, substantially. Maybe that's what they're getting at. Uh, do any of you want to take that on? I mean, from that perspective, I can um, comment that we, we did do those studies. Apologies if the background noise is uh, distracting here. Um, we did do those studies with our in vivo experiments in mice, and uh, we found that the, you could only get reproducible photoacoustic data if you leave the mouse to stabilise for at least 10 minutes before you start uh, imaging. So um, that's because uh, typically the mouse is anaesthetised prior to imaging. Um, and so the body temperature will gradually drop as it goes from being awake and active to being uh, fully anaesthetized prior to being placed within uh, the photoacoustic imaging system. Uh, typically in different preclinical photoacoustic imaging systems that are designed for mice, there's usually a water bath of some sort that will, or a heat pad that we use to maintain the body temperature. Um, and that will normally be aiming at maintaining at 36 degrees. But during the process of um, uh, anaesthetizing the mouse, they can sometimes um, cool their body temperature by several degrees. So you need to give them time to renormalize that. In addition, there's also the effect of respiratory rate, which is actually much more substantial. If you're measuring, for example, a hemoglobin uh, derived biomarker, the respiratory rate will have a substantial influence on the um, quantification of those biomarkers. So you'll need to make sure that for, if you want to compare data from one day to the next or from one mouse to the next that you're doing so under comparable conditions in terms of the respiration rate as well as in terms of the temperature. Thank you Sarah. Uh, anybody want to add something to that? Okay go ahead Adon. So I, I can ask this one to Paul. Uh, can uh, photoacoustic imaging be directly integrated into small surgical devices, uh, e.g. a biopsy needle or a cardiac catheter? Uh, yes, uh, in principle and, and in practice. Um, again, it relates to the um, challenges re relating to endoscopic devices. That's a question of miniaturization. Um, I mean, we've developed um, some very um, compact <coughs> fiber optic ultrasound sensors, so, but we're based on a, a Fabry Peroetalon at the tip of a, a 150 micron diameter fiber uh, that can be inserted into a needle. Um, and uh, those uh, types of sensors have actually been used to um, implement all optical ultrasound imaging um, uh, in cardiology. Um, so. Uh, that is that is something that's that's possible. Um, I haven't seen a lot of other work on that, but uh, again, it's a question of miniaturization, uh, and I'm sure it's something that will emerge in time. Yeah. So Adon's internet is not uh, good enough, uh, I guess, to moderate, but Seren might take over uh, shortly. I'll ask the next question, and maybe then Seren can take over. Um, I, uh, I truly. Chatarchi at uh, Irvine wants to know um, 
there have been a lot of uh, there has been a lot of work focusing on the biomedical applications and potential development of photoacoustic imaging technologies. Do you see the field growing outside the biomedical imaging area? And what would you see as the biggest next step for broad field photoacoustic imaging? Uh, so if the first part of that question is, um, do we see the field growing outside of biomedical imaging, so non-medical non imaging applications? Um, I guess engineering and industrial applications, that sort of thing. Yeah, this is something that, um, you know, I, I've thought about over the years and, and particularly whether we can apply sort of technologies that are developed for photoacoustic imaging in, in for example, non-destructive testing. Um, ge generally speaking, there, there don't seem to be many obvious applications. Um, there's plenty of non-destructive ultrasonic testing and evaluation um, applications um, where one uses laser generated ultrasound so one creates a localized source or uh, the surface of some material and then uses that as a source of ultrasound to do pulse echo ultrasound imaging but that's not really photoacoustics um, as, as we understand it where you're encoding optical information at depth onto uh, an acoustic wave and I guess you need a material with some sort of um, uh, degree of transparency um, whereas most uh, are opaque. Uh, I mean, the only thing that I've ever thought of is something maybe like carbon fiber composite, where you might be able to get some sort of penetration and do something equivalent to photoacoustic imaging. Um, uh, but beyond that, I don't see many obvious applications. I don't know whether anybody else wants to comment on that. I mean, the other issue is that you'd have to know the sound speed, so you'd end up you'd end up doing some sort of sound speed, some sort of ultrasound imaging anyway, just to get the sound speed. So the only reason then for doing the photoacoustics would be if you need to know something about the optical properties or there's some optical contrast which is relevant. And normally when you're looking at non-destructive texting, you're interested in mechanical mechanical aspects. So it's normally the mechanical, uh, that the, the ultrasound is normally what you want. What about uh, coating thicknesses? I seem to remember a paper by the Pelavanov group in Moscow some years ago where they used it to measure very small thicknesses like 60 nanometer thicknesses of films and things like that. Also, maybe could you comment on how gas sensing with photoacoustics relates to this field? So you see that as a totally separate thing, obviously. Yeah, perhaps I could I could answer the, the second question. Um, uh, on 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 sort of gas phase photoacoustics. Um, yeah, my view is quite a different field. Um, really, the only thing it shares is is, is the name. Um, so, in that type of photoacoustic uh, uh, sensing, one typically has some kind of um, uh, target sample, and you enclose it in a gas cell, and you have a low frequency microscope phone positioned in the cell and you put modulated light onto the target um, and you periodically heat it and that causes thermal expansion in the gas layer next to the target uh, and that propagates off as an acoustic wave arriving at the detector. It feels very different from the type of photoacoustic generation that's exploited in photoacoustic imaging as we've been discussing, um, which really relies on the, um, the direct generation of a, of a of a pressure uh, which then relaxes in the form of an acoustic wave that propagates off. Um, so I feel that the signal generation mechanism is quite different, the technology is totally different and the capabilities are, are distinct as well. So I think it's of limited relevance to the field. Um, I know we all, uh, and I, I myself included, refer back to Alexander Graham Bell's original experiment in 1880 uh, and he did observe the photoacoustic effect but it really was a gas phase type effect not the type of direct generation of acoustic waves that's exploited in photoacoustic imaging. Okay. Okay, so the next question is to Sarah from ETA from Netherlands. So is the PA technology appropriate for developing flowmetry for a range of blood vessel sizes? Sure, so that's a really good, uh, good question. There's been quite a lot of research in that area. So there are kind of 
I guess, several other techniques that I normally use for flowmetry. So you, in ultrasound and in optical coherence tomography, for example. And there are a couple of factors that limit the flow detection in those modalities, which photoacoustics could potentially help to come, overcome. So one is the contrast relative to the background. So for example, in photoacoustics, there's a very high contrast of the blood vessels relative to the background tissue, but that's less the case in ultrasound or OCT. Um, and there's also the fact that now photoacoustics relies on absorption for its contrast as opposed to backscatter for the other modalities. So there's quite an extensive number of ways that people have looked at trying to do uh, flowmetry with uh, photoacoustics. And quantification can be quite challenging, as has been reported in the literature, um, for example, due to fluence dependence effects across a vessel and other things. But acoustic resolution systems have shown quite uh, a lot of promise, at least for in vitro flow imaging. Um, I don't know, Paul perhaps maybe wants to comment on this. I know he's done some work on it in the past, so he can maybe comment more precisely. But I think um, what, from the work that I've seen, it's mostly been the case that demonstrations have been made in a more a phantom or an in vitro setting rather than yet in an in vivo setting. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in principle, it's possible to um, uh, use photoacoustics to measure flow. Um, so if you think of red blood cells flowing through a vessel and generating a signal from those, um, that'll encode what amounts to a Doppler shift onto the signal, just in the same way um, that a Doppler shift is encoded onto um, echoes coming from moving red blood cells in ultrasound. Um, and that sort of approach has been exploited um, using optical resolution microscopy. Um, and we've done some work using photoacoustic tomography to try and do the same sort of thing. Um, so in the former technique, it's fairly straightforward to do because you're using a very tightly focused laser beam to excite the acoustic signal. And you can basically spatially resolve individual blood, vessel, uh, blood cells so you can track them as they flow along uh, the vessel. Um, it's proved to be more difficult to do that in the acoustic resolution modes of photoacoustic and like photoacoustic tomography. Um, uh, uh, and it's not quite clear why that is. Is it just that the heterogeneity of blood um, is, is insufficient? Um, it appears as a homogeneous medium photoacoustically or whether there's some other reason for that uh, inability to measure it. Um, so certainly deep tissue photoacoustic flammetry is, is pretty challenging, I would say. Can I suggest we take a break there um, and uh, come back at half past uh, three? That's UK Irish time or, or Google Galway time, if you, if you get confused. Um, Matt uh, O'Donnell will be joining us from Seattle, so do uh, ask your questions for Matt as well. Uh, thank you for all the questions so far. And uh, yeah, it, it, unless somebody has something urgent to say, maybe let's uh, leave it until uh, 3.30. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, thanks folks. Uh, see you at the uh, end, yeah, about 25 minutes. Okay, bye now. Do we hang up and rejoin then? Um, no, just uh, mute yourselves and turn off your uh, thing and I'll just share a link, uh, a slide here to show that we're on break. OK.
and brave fourteen. Hello, folks. Um, I'm back. I don't know if uh, anybody else is back. I'm here, Martin. Hi, Saren. Uh, are the others back yet? Did you want to start with the questions then, Saren? Um, well, I don't know if that's for you, Martin. Like, if you want to get Yeah, no, I think it's good for you to have an opportunity to ask some questions. Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I think we have some questions for Sarah now. Is that right, mostly? Or? Yes, Sarah and Ben. Yeah, so Sarah, would you prefer your questions to come early or later? Or does it matter? I, I don't mind. OK, yeah, it's not going to matter to the drilling that's going on. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. It's just, uh, yeah, if, if it was avoidable. Um, I, I guess if it's uh, if for any reason it gets uh, overwhelming, then Ben, you're, you're happy to jump in, I guess, and uh, help out. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm, I'm going to start up and uh, ask Aaron to make us go. We are live, are we? We're live already. So that's great. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And uh, Sarah, can you start with the first question, please? Sure. So this is to Sarah. It's from Valeria, Amsterdam. Uh, is there any endogenous chromophore or exogenous agent suitable to mark wounds inflammation using photoacoustic? Yep, so um, there's been quite a lot of work looking at just uh, endogenous hemoglobin as a, a method for marking inflammation. Um, so this has been looked at in inflammatory diseases as well as in uh, wound healing responses. And it's been shown that uh, enhancements in the uh, signals from photoacoustics based on kind of total hemoglobin content can be uh, useful in um, giving a reflection of the severity of inflammation in the tissue kind of broadly. Um, and examples in which that's been done, uh, there's a quite prominent example, which I highlighted in my talk in Crohn's disease, where uh, they've actually used uh, photoacoustic tomography to uh, measure non-invasively um, severity of inflammation in the colon, and that was based on the use of haemoglobin. Um, and that was uh, verified by endoscopy and by histopathology, so showing that an increase in the total haemoglobin level was correlated with the increase in the severity of the inflammation. There's also been a range of papers that have uh, looked at this in terms of wound healing, particularly looking at uh, oxygen saturation in that case. Uh, so this is important if you're from a surgical or from a wound healing perspective, because if your tissue isn't adequately oxygenated, it's likely that it's not going to be viable in the long term. So this is a question that clinicians often want to ask is how well oxygenated the tissue is. So people have also investigated the application there. I have seen a couple of studies where they've used targeted contrast agents uh, in order to enhance that uh, amount of information, but I would say the majority of studies that at least I've seen reported have focused on the use of the endogenous chromophores with hemoglobin. Thanks for that. The next question is um, from Vajahat. Uh, so he, he has two questions. So the first one is, can we use the ultrasound broadband light, so, light source to increase the penetration depth by generating the air bubbles? And if it does, will it have a negative impact if the ultrasound intensity remains sufficiently low so that it does not damage the tissue? I'm afraid I don't understand that question, so I'd have to ask them to repose it in order to better understand what they're asking. OK. Uh, so the next question is from Ashwini, Sweden. And so she also has three questions. The first one is vasculature variation among basal and laminal cores were evident. How would we sort it out from an infection led oxidative stress? Which could be an additional predominant parameter that can dis discriminate early stage tumor cells? So maybe I can address that one first and then we can go through the others. So in terms of looking at variation in vasculature between uh, in a spatial sense in tumors, uh, I think if you were concerned that uh, signals that you would be receiving or the, um, the vasculature variation might be actually um, governed by oxidative stress, the best way to um, 
try and delineate that would be to use a contrast agent that is reactive to either reactive oxygen species or other um, types of oxidative stress. So you could spatially map the distribution of oxidative stress in the tumour uh, as well as having the haemoglobin data. That's something we actually did we, in a paper that we published uh, last year in Cancer Research. The first author on that is uh, Weber. And in that paper, we looked at the um, distribution of hydrogen peroxide uh, in tumours in, and we looked at it in, in context of haemoglobin as well. So there are contrast agents that you can use to um, pick out oxidative stress. In terms of early stage tumour cells, I guess the challenge here is that you're not looking at the tumour cells unless you have a biological system in which you've labelled them with a reporter gene that can generate an absorbing signal that photoacoustics can depict. So otherwise you're purely looking at endogenous absorbers and so you're not going to get a specific signal from your tumour cells. So if you wanted to study early stage tumour biology, you, you would need to have a genetically engineered system in which you generated um, the contrast there, or at least be able to identify the location of the tumour if you specifically wanted to look at vascular variation in early stage biology. So you could do that, for example, by imaging um, early stage lesions um, if you knew where they were arising, either through an independent measurement of size, for example, with ultrasound, um, or by using a window chamber type approach where you could visually see optically where the tumour cells are emerging. OK, so the next part of the question is were these quantification studies done on on at predetermined depths using any other modalities such as ultrasound or MRI? And have you come across with partial volume issues at any point? So I think Ashwini is referring to um, the studies that we did looking at spatial distribution of uh, the vasculature again. So this was studies that I presented in the um, in my talk in the context of looking at oxygenation and whether that could be a useful metric to pursue clinically. Um, so these studies that we've uh, that I presented there have also been, um, those same tumours have been imaged with uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, they weren't imaged with ultrasound because uh, in my institute, the photoacoustic systems we have are not coupled with uh, ultrasound. So we don't have a reference ultrasound image, but we do have methods for co-registration of our data with magnetic resonance imaging. So we can compare with dynamic contrast enhanced MRI or any other types of MRI that you might wish to um, compare to. Um, in terms of partial volume effects, um, not in the particular um, cases that we were studying uh, in those um, in those data that I presented. So no, and not in that case. And the last part is, have you noticed any add-on features like stability in so I'm not exactly sure what that uh, its question is referring to, but I'm going to take it as me asking about the reproducibility of the signal of ICG compared to other biomarkers. Um, so that's how I'm going to interpret stability. Um, I think that if you um, do talk about it in terms of reproducibility, our um, experience has been that the most reproducible metrics that you can extract from photoacoustic data are typically um, deltas. So measuring a change, be that a ratio between two, um, two measurements or a, di a difference between two measurements. Um, and the reason I say that is typically um, that from, let's say, mouse to mouse, subject to subject, you'll get intrinsic biological variations in the baseline. So if you're trying to compare markers across a group, uh, measuring absolute values, um, in any biological system, regardless of whether it's photoacoustic or not, um, means you'll have a higher level of biological variation in your data set. So if you measure a delta, um, response to a stimulus can often be uh, a more comparable metric. Furthermore, in photoacoustics, um, we typically find, as Ben will have touched on in the quantification, there are lots of challenges in quantifying an absolute number, such as a, a concentration value or a percent heat, um, oxygenation. If you instead look at a relative change, uh, you again are kind of accounting for some of those uh, factors that can lead to inaccuracies. Um, and we've generally found that you can get a much better coefficient of variation in your imaging studies and if you're looking at those. So an example of that would be um, doing an oxygen breathing gas challenge and looking at the change in oxygenation between two states for a given animal. And you can get reproducibility in that sort of uh, setting that's much, much higher than if you just look at the, a baseline level of oxygenation. OK, thank you so much. The next question is from Sumana, Spain. 
So what are the major factors that you would consider to figure out what would be the best my biomarker for a particular experiment? Well, the usual way that we go about uh, working this out is by asking ourselves, what's the biological question we want to answer? So either what's the hypothesis or what's the question that we want to answer? So if I, I hypothesize that um, the, the tumor vasculature is going to evolve in a particular way over time, then I need to measure a biomarker that's relating to that tumor vasculature. And that might be an architectural biomarker. So it might be a number that parameterizes, let's say, the number of blood vessels or the number of branches in those blood vessels. Or it might be a number that tells me the oxygenation within them. So there are many different ways that you can parameterize and extract quantitative numbers from your photoacoustic data with all of the caveats that are associated with that. I think the factor that you, you most want to consider when choosing which one to use um, to begin with is what's the biological question you want to answer. You then want to say to answer that question, if I can use three or four different biomarkers, which one's the most robust? So which one can I measure reproducibly uh, in my biological system? And that might be that question. You might have to take um, an animal system and you might have to make some measurements so you can get an idea of what the effect size is, so how big the change is in the system that you're measuring. Once you've got that, that gives you a, a met, met, metric from which you can calculate the statistical power for going on to actually doing a fully powered study. And in that case, then your final question is, can I actually measure this parameter reliably with photoacoustics? So just if, if I'm taking a metric out, how is it being calculated? Is it being calculated from multiple different wavelengths? What's the spectral processing that's being applied? After that, what's the what? How am I drawing the region of interest to extract my metric? Uh, so there are many different levels of um, that this level this question could really go to. But I'd say regardless of how how deep you want to go in the accuracy of the uh, final output, the starting question and the driver should be the biological question and what's the best biomarker to answer it. Thanks very much for that. So the next question is from Aidan. So what are the technical challenges associated with miniaturizing ultrasound transducers? Do you want me to answer this, sir? Because you've been talking a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Sure. Um, so there's 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 essentially there's a couple of things, I guess. So one, if you're using piezoelectrics for detection, then uh, as you make the elements smaller, they become less sensitive. Um, so that's a problem. Photoacoustic signals are not particularly strong signals, and we're limited by the amount of light we can put in. Um, the other the other factor is if you're building an array, then it's the cost of fabrication when they start to become tiny that is a, is a limiting factor. Thanks, Ben. So the next question is also to Ben. Exogenous contrast agents like anisotropic nanoparticles tend to have a broad absorption spectrum. How does it affect unmixing, especially if they have a broad absorption at second NIR window where water absorption is high? So if we just think about um, if we just think about the spectroscopic question, irrespective of the, the difficult photoacoustic parts, then as long as your spectra, as long as the, 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 the uh, wavelengths you've chosen give you spectra that are linearly independent, then you can you can separate them. So the fact it's broadband per se isn't a problem. Um, I mean, do, I expect one of the other questions I think I noticed in a minute is going to be about the quantitative aspects. Um, in, if you've got a photoacoustic spectrum, or if you've got, for example, images photoacoustic images of different wavelengths, and you take the values of the corresponding pixel, the different wavelengths to give you a spectrum that won't correspond to the, the optical spectrum, absorption spectrum. So you, you can't do straightforward spectroscopy on that image and expect to, expect to get out the answer. Um, you need to correct for the light fluence distribution. Um, that's, a, that's a slightly separate question. I'm not quite sure about the second part of the question. So how does it affect unmixing, especially if they have a broad absorption in the second NIR region? Uh, yeah, I don't have an answer to that part. OK, so the next question is to Ben again from Aiden. You mentioned that corrections for sensor array characteristics characteristics should be factored in for accurate quantitative photoacoustic imaging. Can you elaborate on this, please? Right, OK, so um, 
just thinking about a normal freedom acoustic image set at the moment, not, not any optical properties, just trying to get the initial acoustic pressure distribution. Um, most of the image reconstruction algorithms um, that are analytical assume that your detectors are, are point detectors, which are, have an omnidirectional detection response. Um, in practice, detectors will have some directionality and potentially some quite significant directionality. Um, and if you're if the if the region that if if where you look the thing you're looking at is not directly in front of your detectors, then the amplitude of the waves reaching the detector are going to be attenuated by the the fact they're coming in at an angle to the detector. So you need to somehow deconvolve for the detection response of the detector. Um, and there's there's quite a bit of stuff on that in the literature. I mean, the simplest method is probably to put it into the forward model and do an iterative reconstruction, but that, that might not be the quickest way of doing it. Thanks, Ben. Perfect. I think we have Matt on line now as well, hopefully. Just he's joined us. Uh, yeah. So you're muted there, Matt. Oh, perfect. Yes, Thank I'm you. on. Can you see me? I'm kind of between two cameras here. Oh, yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you so much. OK. So sorry, uh, I was uh, trying to connect multiple ways, and of course it didn't work just at the time I'm doing this. And it's early morning in the west coast of the United States. So um, let me see it's, here. It's amazing. The, the only two people we have trouble with are the ones from Seattle. And that's where Microsoft are making this stuff. So <laughs> yes. well, of course, you, you realize that they know. They know me. <laughs> I didn't Great. say they like me. I didn't say they like me, but they do know me uh, so we, over there. We've had a lot of questions. Um, so if if the attendees want to start asking questions for Matt now, that would be really great. Um, uh, as well, and we can continue, Saren, where you were with uh, with your questions. So, so go ahead. Um. Okay. So the next question is also to Ben. Can the K-Wave platform be adapted to simulate acoustic optic imaging modality? Um, it's not ideal. So K-Wave, because it originally started for photoacoustics models, broadband acoustic pulses in the time domain. Um, Acousta optics, I think, normally uses uh, single frequencies, and, and the idea is that you focus them. I mean, you could model that in K-Wave. You could model the acoustic part of Acousta optics in K-Wave, but it's not going to be the most efficient way to do it. You probably want some sort of Helmholtz solver um, to do that. And of course, and K-Wave won't model the the optical part at all because it's an acoustic acoustic solver. Thank you, Ben. So the next question is also to you. In your lecture, you mentioned to pre-process the RF data, one can deconvolve the raw data with the transducer response. Is that where people often do in practice? Will not the noise in the raw data being being amplified by the deconvolution process? Right, so yeah, if you're taking measurements with a transducer that's got a bandwidth, which is less than the photoacoustic signal, which is typically the case if you've got, for example, a piezo detector based on PZT, um, then you'll want to deconvolve the response. Um, if you do it naively, you end up sort of dividing by zeros and you'll get you'll amplify the noise. So it's an ill-posed inverse problem. Um, there are ways you can do it, things like Vena filters, but typically they boil down to somehow windowing out the frequencies where you don't have any energy or where you've only got noise and just deconvolving in the part of the bandwidth where you've got signal. Um, but as with all inverse problems, there's like an infinite number of possible solutions. So normally it's a bit um, trial and error. For example, you don't want to you don't want to apply a bandpass filter to your data that's got too steep edges because you'll see ringing in the time domain. So you've got to you've got to choose your filter carefully, um, and and it'll probably boil down to what you've actually got in practice as to what you do. There's there's lots of literature on deconvolving um, in the in the in the literature. Thanks very much. The next question is to Ben from Gary regarding deep learning for photoacoustic tomography recon reconstruction. What are the typical ground truth data used to train these networks? How much data do you need or is there a data set available for this? Well, yes, good question. Um, so t typically, um, well, certainly in my experience and I think what other people have done, they've generated the ground truth data from simulation. 
Um, so we, we use K-Wave and one of the things we've done is we've taken a whole load of Vesely type images, in fact from a from a lung database actually, but lots of Vesely images and we've used K-Wave to, uh, well we've used a light model first of all to calculate what the initial pressure distribu distribution might be, then we've used K-Wave to simulate the acoustic measurements and we've added some noise over the top and then we've reconstructed those images and then we've got pairs of ground truth image and the and the uh, photoacoustic image and we can train or just go from the time series to the to the to the ground truth image and you can train the network based on those. Um, how many you need it's going to depend on it's going to depend on how general the situation is you want to model how big your how big your network is um, but I mean you'll need hundreds or thousands of images typically. Um, the, the, other, the other issue I guess to think about is um, if you want to do it in 3D, the, the network can't be can't be too big because it, I mean, in terms of the number of layers and things, because it'll just get very large in terms of memory. Um. Thanks so much. So the next question is from Valeria. Uh, so she asked, which of uh, which could be a good image processing approach to correct the light fluence variation along depth in photoacoustic imaging? Well, good question. Uh, I think if we knew the answer to that, we'd be very happy. I mean, the first approximation is that it decays exponentially. But what what the what the the, the coefficient of that exponentially is is a, is a good question. I mean, one of the things we've done in the past to try and get a first approximation, if if you're illuminating directly from one side, um, is we've um, just projected all the projected the photoacoustic image onto a single line. In other words, sub summed it all up onto a single line and looked at the exponential decay of that and said that's going to be related to the to the um, the fact that light is attenuating as it goes into the tissue. Of course, that's not quite right because you're also going to have some drop off acoustic drop off. So if you look at an ultrasound machine, for example, they have a similar acoustic attenuation because of absorption and so on, and there'll be a limited view effect. So it's not ideal. Um, Another thing you might do if you if you have some way of finding out what the background properties of the tissue are with some other with some other modality, that might be a way you could get a you could get a first estimate. But it's a it's a difficult problem. Thank you. So the next question is from Meng Li from Sweden, and it's it can be it is addressed to anybody. So would it be possible to use photoacoustic spectroscopy to perform non-invasive blood glucose test? Uh, I'll, this is Matt. I can start in that because there was a company I was involved with which did that and failed uh, <laughs> uh, many years ago. So it was uh, in the previous generation of technologies, a company called Glucon. Um, and so, yes, uh, theoretically, absolutely uh, true. But a good friend of mine in Silicon Valley talks all the time is there is an entire graveyard of companies for non-invasive glucose sensing. Um, there are other technologies which are minimally invasive, which set a very high bar for trying to do it non-invasively with uh, uh, photoacoustics. But of course, theoretically, yes. I mean, it has a molecular signature. Glucose has a molecular signature. Uh, if it has reasonable concentrations, you have close enough, close enough access, you can go after it. But uh, unless you guys, other folks know for certain, uh, I don't know of a com uh, actual commercial application of that right now compared to the uh, sort of minimally invasive uh, approaches which are used now. Do either of you know uh, of any commercial? No, not commercial. I've only seen research articles looking at it at, in the kind of that uh, near yeah. red range, the sort of yeah. 1200 yeah. to 1700 range, but I've not seen anything commercial. Okay, yeah, just a, something we have to advise the, the, the younger researchers to, to be very skeptical about because there's a new company every month comes out. Yes, um, right. and, and actually from very reputable uh, universities like University of Washington and places like that, you know, uh, with plausible <laughs> ideas about how to measure something relating to glucose. And of course, the signal goes up and down with glucose, but it always fails at the point of can you get the reliability, reproducibility and accuracy that the FDA require? Um, on the plus side, we do know exactly what is required to make it commercial overnight success because the director of the FDA has written a document telling us exactly what the marred values, the statistical uh, requirements are to make this okay. 
And in Europe, you will see that some devices using combinations of thermal and acoustic and other things uh, get CE approval and do various things, but uh, none of these have the diagnostic accuracy that you would want uh, your granny or your, certainly your insurance company would not allow you to tell somebody to inject themselves with insulin based on these numbers. So, so it's a cautionary tale, but 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 um, you know, great success if somebody does it, and and somebody hopefully will do it someday. So I don't want to say to anybody, don't do it. But just um, we should always be skeptical. But in this one, be super super skeptical about uh, about things. I would say. Uh, well said, Martin. You 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 must have a, a member of the graveyard in your history. I have scars, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there you go. OK. Thank you, Matt. So the next question is to Sarah from Katrina. So what what are the present state of what? What is the current state of art uh, in neonatal brain imaging with photoacoustic techniques? Is it necessary to acquire? Um, Acquire measure on uh, the question is a bit confusing. Yeah, I think they're basically asking um, a little bit about um, how this could be applied to to neonates and what the respective depth penetration would would need to be. Um, so actually, in my um, talk, I was showing an example of um, treatment of uh, twin to twin transfusion syndrome in a, an ex vivo human placenta. So it's slightly different from the question that they're asking here. Um, I have to say, I haven't uh, seen a, a great deal of uh, use of photoacoustics uh, in the neonatal space myself. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I don't know if Ben or Matt have any up to date knowledge or could refer to some papers that they might might be worth um, bringing up there. I don't know about neonatal, but I, I've seen a couple of papers where people have done some primate brain imaging with photoacoustics. Um, I mean, the image reconstruction is not trivial in that you need to account for the skull. And I guess part of the question here is to what extent you need to account for the skull in the baby? I would say yes, you would have to, because while uh, you can get light in pretty easily, I imagine it's going to have quite different acoustic properties, even in a neonate. Yeah, I mean, I've seen um, some sort of measurements from sort of intact human brain as well and like from adult brain. And in those cases, you're really looking at very superficial um, data just under the skull. Um, I think there's also been some data from canine so from a few different species. People have been looking at this, but I couldn't think of anything from the neonatal perspective. Matt would probably be able to say more about the acoustic effects of the skull. Well, acoustic effects of the skull are disgusting. Um... They're very hard to deal with. Uh, they they can be dealt with. I mean, but it's it's uh, it's in a challenge. You need an adaptive approach uh, uh, to deal with that. Neonate now for imaging versus photoacoustic sensing. There's been photo a lot of photoacoustic sensing in the neonate uh, brain, um, and the guys in Houston have done a lot. Renat in Houston has done a lot of that, but they are sort of single channel systems and. They localize, but but they're not imaging, and they use it for uh, continuous monitoring, um, you know, in the in the intensive care. Uh, but that's the only clinical I know of. I don't know of any imaging. Has that uh, got clinical now, Matt? This is a measurement of oxygen in the superior sagittal sinus, that V-shaped brain between the hemispheres, as I understand it. Yeah. I don't know if it's that depth. I don't know. Renat has been working on this for quite some time, and um, but I don't know if it's uh, uh, if it's to that depth. But they would be the people. If you're looking for a literature, those are the people I'd, I'd go after. Uh, that's the thread I'd follow. So that's Renat Esenaliev. E S right. A N I L I E V. I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks so much for that. So the next question is from Vajahat. It's to Sarah. So can we use the ultrasound sensor with broadband light source to increase the penetration depth by generating the air bubbles in tissues? If the this is the same question that we, we had yes. earlier. So can you, it, it's not really changed very much. Can you give some clarification to what you think it means? 
I still don't understand exactly what they're asking. Are they talking about acoustic cavitation in the tissue to generate air bubbles or something else? OK, so we can move on to the next question, which is from uh, Mafis. Which secondary biomarkers deserve more attention, for example, for breast imaging applications? Uh, I assume by secondary biomarkers, you mean biomarkers other than haemoglobin, which has received a lot of attention for the breast imaging application. I would say in the context of breast imaging, there would be quite a large amount of interest in uh, understanding whether we could extract useful data in relation to the other endogenous biomarkers such as lipids, water and collagen. Um, and that's because the molecular composition of the tissue um, changes rather dramatically with the invasion of um, uh, of a tumour. So the breast is a rather uh, lipid rich organ as a gland and as the, the tissue becomes malignant um, it becomes actually tends to push out the lipid and become a bit more water rich. So it's possible that looking <laughs> at those types of biomarkers uh, could also be useful for the breast imaging application. That's something that's been examined in the past using Raman spectroscopy and using uh, x-ray diffraction and other types of uh, x-ray imaging. So it's possible that those biomarkers, which have also been shown to be useful in other modalities, could be explored further with photoacoustics. There have been some papers where people have already looked at those, but not so much to the level of validation that we would need um, to pursue them further. Thanks so much, Sarah. So can we go back to the previous question that was skipped? So he has clarified it. So he says when we use ultrasound with laser, it generates air bubbles in tissues that helps in forward scattering to increase the penetration depth. So his question is, can we use ultrasound with broadband light source instead of a laser to increase the penetration depth? Maybe Matt has some background in that. Yeah, well, so um, I'm still a little confused, but but uh, let me tell you some things I do know is that um, there's been quite a bit of work. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Michael, Michel, um, Marbiz or something like that. I forget. He's at Berkeley. He did some work on uh, trying to make uh, light pipes, and the idea is is that uh, you're looking it up, Sarah. Look for it. Marbiz or something like that. He's in in electrical. I'm going to try and find Berkeley. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't trust my computer after what I went through the first half hour this morning. So anyway. Um, and uh, the idea was is to use a photo refractive effect. So, uh, I, um, excuse me, uh, uh, acousto refractive effect. That is, is the pressure waves uh, because they change uh, the density very slightly, you know, to, to parts per, per 10,000 or something like that, um, change the refractive index. And so by uh, channeling a high intensity ultrasound uh, a wave, is that you can uh, slightly change the reflective in index and try to produce a waveguide. And I thought it was a very, very clever idea, um, but the numbers get to you. It's just too weak in effect. So they published a paper showing some uh, uh, penetration, uh, extra penetration, um, but it was not really practical per se. But there's been a lot of ideas floated. I've not seen a, a definitive publication on this. This is sort of coffee conversations at conferences is, is that, oh, that's a cool effect, but can you make it bigger? And the answer is, let me just say, yes, you can. Um, uh, but I would not call it non-invasive, right? The whole idea was to try to make these light pipes truly non-invasive, but, but I think there's ways to do it minimally invasively. And then yes, you can, and, and the applications, um, where I've seen is not just for photoacoustics, but for upconversion. So uh, for photodynamic therapies, trying to use long wavelength light to go down to nanoparticles, which they can up upconvert and create um, uh, visible light and use that for things like photodynamic therapy. Um, and uh, they just can't, you know, you can get better penetration at around 1064, but still not enough. But again, this light pipe idea was to try to do that. So. I think it's a great topic for young folks to go, you know, waste a few years of their lives on um, this. But if you come up with a clever trick, there's a lot more applications than photoacoustics. Right. Being able to penetrate deeply. Thanks very much, Matt. 
So the next question is again to Sarah. Uh, do you think acoustic optical imaging has matured well as a field in comparison to photoacoustic imaging? I think it probably depends on the context that you ask the question, but for me, at least in biomedical imaging, I think the maturity of photoacoustic imaging is uh, much more apparent. It's much more widespread in terms of biomedical application, both in the preclinical and the clinical setting. So I think that would be my relatively simplistic answer to that question. Anyone else is welcome to weigh in if they have a more detailed one. Can we go ahead to the next question? I think so. OK, so this question is to Matt. Uh, and OK, so these questions are to Ben. Could you introduce a bit about developments and challenges of quantitative photoacoustic tomography? Are there any in vivo results of quantitative photoacoustic tomography that has been reported? Well, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> so perhaps, uh, perhaps the first place to start is there's, there's quite a few papers um, where people have taken photoacoustic spectra and just linearly unmixed and claim they can get some values, for example, oxygenation. Uh, I'm highly skeptical of that. Um, I think you need to do some form of fluence correction. Um, now, on that side of things, there's a lot of theoretical work being done. So, uh, so the mathematicians got excited about this about uh, 10 years ago and did, and did a lot of work. Um, and there's also been quite a lot of practical approaches. But I think Matt talked about one um, in his talk. Um, what is missing, though, is it's very difficult, especially in vivo, but even in a phantom, it's very difficult to get some sort of validated, validated measurements some ground truth measurements to compare to. So I think there's a big gap in the literature for validation of quantitative photoacoustics. In fact, Sarah, I could do a plug for Sarah set up this International Photoacoustic Standardization Consortium, and one of its aims is to try and tackle this problem. So if, if you if you all want to go and join that, that would be great. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it is a big problem, and, it, it, and there are a lot of claims in the literature which I'm which I think are a bit specious. Yeah, I applaud that too, Sarah. And you're tied in with the FDA folks too, right? Yeah. Right. That's what I thought. And I applaud that tremendously because, uh, yeah, trying to get a true oxygenation measurement, for example, reproducibly is and validated is uh, very, very tough. I've also tried, and I'm sure I know you guys, UCL and, and others have that, but when you're uh, looking at these beautiful microvascular pictures, I keep on wanting to validate them. And it's really, really tough to truly validate. I mean, they look beautiful, but how do you validate them? So I think uh, this move towards a standard is, is a very important. And all the other image modalities have something like this. Uh, so I think it's very, very important. Thanks very much, Matt and Ben. So the next question is addressed to Ben. Is in your lecture of on optimization approach, part on optimization approach part, there is a metrics in optimization problem. Is this A metrics the same as the A metrics in the earlier part of metrics approach in your lecture? So can we also just record the impulse response for each pixel to form the A metrics? Uh, right, so that, that A is, is certainly a forward operator, which might be in the form of a matrix, or it might be in the form of some numerical model like K-Wave. Um, if your setup is is small enough that you've got your the number of the number of voxels in your image and the and the number of detectors you've got, if it's small enough that you can record your impulse responses and put them into a matrix, then great, because then because then uh, then you're away. If you've got the if you've got the form model, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, often that's going to be difficult. That's going to be a big matrix. Um, so often you 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 want some other some some implicit method like K wave, which works so you don't have an explicit matrix. But certainly, yeah, that A could be that same matrix. Thanks very much. So the next question is uh, to Ben. You mentioned several different approaches for image reconstruction for photoacoustics. Could combining multiple approaches result in a better reconstruction? That's an interesting question. Um, 
OK, let's think about back projection approaches. So I, I, I talked mainly about the universal back projection, but there's lots of different back projection approaches, which which if you've got ideal data, they'll all give you the same image. But if you've got if you've got incomplete data, they, they won't give you quite the same image. Um, and some so, for example, they'll respond differently to noise. Uh, so if then you generated several images from your incomplete data, they'd have different artifacts from the noise. Some of the artifacts, though, are we inherent in the inverse problem. For example, if you've got a limited view situation, you'll have some arc type artifacts. Now, all of the reconstruction algorithms will give you the same thing because that's inherent in the inverse problem. So uh, it's possible you might be able to combine, uh, you know, get a sort of uh, get a sort of collection of images and somehow that'll give you some idea of the uncertainty um, involved in the image. I mean, the only other way I can think of answering the question is you might use you might use, um, uh, for example, an analytical formula um, to give you a first image in order to then put into an iterative reconstruction to give you a starting point for the iterative. Um, because it, with the iterative reconstructions, it would be much quicker if you can start, and much more likely to converge if you can start close to the right answer. Thanks, Ben. So the next question is from Vajahat. So he says, um, within the optical window, we observe that the cytochrome C oxidase has higher absorption value compared to hemoglobin. And so it affects the overall spectrum. What would be the impact of cytochrome C oxidase if it affects the tissue locally? I'm going to pass this to someone else. I can maybe make a comment on on that. So I guess cytochrome C oxidase has a very strong absorption, but at the very um, short wavelengths. So not really in what we would typically be referring to as the optical window for photoacoustics, where we're typically looking more in the near infrared. Um, so if you're measuring um, down in the sort of 400 to 500 nanometer range, then yes, indeed, you could probably see uh, other cytochromes like cytochrome C oxidase, uh, as well as the, the hemoglobins. Um, there has been some work looking at microscopy of cytochrome C oxidase. So because it's relatively short wavelength, you're typically rather depth limited. Um, but that was relatively early on in the field of photoacoustics. And I haven't seen much recently um, looking at that specifically. Um, so my interpretation um, in terms of the optical window um, is that just be because the, it falls off quite sharply, the absorption, as far as I recall, um, quite with relatively short wavelengths. So it wouldn't really be impacting us in the near infrared range where we're typically doing tomography type measurements. So it could have an impact if you're looking at the microscopy measurements and that's probably where you'd need to consider it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the next question is to Matt. How do you compound or add all optoacoustic images at different wavelengths together. How do you make spectral and motion corrections after to remove these artifacts? Sure, OK, so I think I'll go backwards in answering that. Um, so we interleave the uh, photoacoustic and ultrasound frames at very high uh, frame rates. In fact, we can do the ultrasound up to five kilohertz uh, if needed. And so we use the ultrasound to track motion and we can do it, uh, you know, at, at, at millisecond kind of time constants. So uh, and we've done that forever. We've been doing that for 30 years uh, in my lab and it's uh, a clinical technology now in, in traditional ultrasound, not at these high rates. But anyway, we can do them at the high rates. So we track. So we use the ultras interleaved ultrasound to track where where tissue is going. So we know where it's going. And then we uh, uh, have photoacoustic frames at different wavelengths interlaced with those ultrasound frames. So we have a very simple model uh, that just tracks uh, over whatever set of, uh, of optical frames you need to look at the spectrum. We track the ultrasound frames and we just map where everybody's going. So for each photoacoustic frame, we re-reference it to the frame of the first wavelength. OK, so every subsequent frame has been re-registered. So now all the photoacoustic frames at the different wavelengths are re-registered. And this is done 
at least we can do it in a computer in real time. We don't have hardware to do it in real time, yes, but in the computer we can do it in real time. And then, um, okay, so they're now registered. Now you can just go pixel by pixel, and it's just a simple spectroscopy measurement, right? You just look at whatever the photoacoustic signal is with wavelength, you get your spectrum, and then you analyze that spectrum, and you can analyze it many ways, right? I mean, you can try to extract components, or you can <clears throat> just be looking for, uh, emphasize a single component. And so that's how we compound it. So, so uh, the images I showed in my little talk this time was a simple method where we just project onto a single spectrum. So we just say, here's, a, here's the measured spectrum. Here's a spectrum of a particular constituent we're, we're interested in. What piece of this spectrum is from that component? And then we show that component as an image. And so we showed that just for two to separate a needle and a contrast agent. But you can be much more sophisticated in the idea. But the main thing is, is you have to make these corrections. So one's the motion. The other one you didn't mention in your question is the fluence, which Ben was talking about before, is that <clears throat> if you correct for the motion, so everybody's re-register, you now have to correct the spectrum for what the fluence is. And you know we have a method I talked about in my um, in my talk. There's many other methods uh, people have proposed, but if you do both of those, then it's like you're in a spectrophotometer, right? So each pixel is its own spectrophotometer. And you can then do a spectral analysis just like you would, uh, you know, a bulk sample in the spectrophotometer. That's the principle, anyway. Sounds easy to say, especially when you're looking at a Zoom screen, or excuse me, a Teams screen, a Microsoft Teams screen. Um, when you're uh, when you're doing that, it's easy to say, but that's tough to get all that stuff to work because you got to get a lot of stuff working very fast uh, uh, to do that. And it's got to be uh, uh, got to be pretty quantitative uh, to be able to to make good spectral measurements. Thanks very much, Matt. So the next question to you is from Robert UCL. Uh, when combining photoacoustic imaging together with confocal microscopy, are there any issues that occur in the photoacoustic imaging due to the actuation or scanning of the system for each point image? So um, not that I know of. I mean, there are uh, things which are which are slightly different. The depth dependence is different, right? Um, that you have because uh, they're both integrating and they do not have the same uh, depth profiles. Um, it, there's uh, not bleaching or any of those types of effects typically in the uh, in the photoacoustic uh, signals. Or there can be uh, changes in the uh, in agents and chromophores. Um, but not that I know of, and I, I'm not, I don't do much microscopy. we we do microscopy in specialized, uh, settings, uh, not, not building big microscopy systems. Maybe Ben or Sarah could have a comment in addition about microscopy setups. But, but to my knowledge is, is that, uh, uh, there are no major differences or issues, uh, with the scanning for other than, you know, the scanning approach is slow. And so there has been a lot of um, uh, work recently of uh, from a lot of groups. I know Northwestern group and from um, over in Shenzhen and, and from several places of ways to try to parallel process and try to speed up uh, uh, microscopy. But um, in the traditional scanning approach, I, I don't know of big issues. Sarah, do you know of any big issues or? I'm also not super familiar with the microscopy setting either, so I don't yeah. know of any major ones, but I've not used it myself, so can't comment from personal experience. Yeah, so so we do some microscopy, like I said, we do it in a very specialized uh, specialized way, which is not like the, the papers that you see with the, the scanned photoacoustic uh, microscopy, the, the optical, uh, optical resolution system. Thank you, Matt. So, so the next question is from Etta, Netherlands. When carrying out photoacoustic imaging, photoacoustic and ultrasound measurements, should the two systems be synchronized in terms of sending and receiving the signals? Absolutely. Um, sorry, I, I assume that was to me. Um, yes. Yes. So, so absolutely. And in fact, uh, one of the issues which we had early on when I first got into photoacoustics about 20 years ago, I had this issue that disturbed me very much as an ultrasound person. And that is, is that in a traditional photoacoustic system, the laser is the master and everybody else is the slave. And that is not the way we do ultrasound. 
Um, so uh, we've stri we've worked very hard over a long time to get uh, a lasers, diopump solid state lasers now, which we can externally trigger. And we can do those at single wavelength, multi wavelength and all that. But the reason we did that, it sounds like a trivial point, but the reason we did that is it's now fully graded into ultrasound. So I can, I can, I can run a non, uh, which is very standard in ultrasound. I can run it non fixed repetition rates, variable repetition rates, variable sequences, interleave, Doppler, elastography, imaging, all that with photoacoustic. We can do all of this stuff. And the reason is, is because we use the ultrasound master clock, which is an oven controlled oscillator inside an ultrasound system is the master clock for the whole system. And then that synchronized and drives, uh, drives everything. Um, uh, and yes, you need precise control. Once you have precise control uh, over the system, uh, then uh, you can do a lot of things. So for example, this motion tracking I talked about, no way you could do that without uh, proper synchronization. And we, we talk about picosecond kinds of synchronizations, which we don't get with lasers. We get like nanosecond, but the rest of the system is tens of picoseconds. So yes, we need absolute synchronization. Uh, and then you process obviously photoacoustic and ultrasound data differently because one's two-way propagation, one's one-way propagation. But all of that is because you have an absolute time register, you can do that. Thank you, Matt. The next question to you is by Ricky. It was mentioned that in spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging, one must correct for both physiological motion and wavelength dependent fluence. How are these corrections implemented specifically in the context of diffusion theory? OK, so the motion I just talked about quite a bit, and so I won't go back into that. The fluence is, yes, it, it, it uses diffusion theory. So we have a model just uh, like all the others have done. Um, and I think it's fairly standard uh, uh, in the literature. We have obviously some slight variations because it has to do with the geometry, so specific geometry of the way which we deliver light. But yes, it's based on, on the diffusion theory. And the trick that we have that allows us is that um, by varying the source of the light, so we rapidly vary the position of the source of the light, if our absorber, let me see if we can get the camera to do this, if our absorber is fixed, Right, so if our absorber is fixed, we're now varying the spatial position of the light source. Then the way the light diffuses to that particular point is modeled with diffusion theory, and from that you then invert and get what the what the uh, fluence was down to this object here. Okay, and then you can change it as a function of wavelength. So you do that for every wavelength. You then have this model for as a function of wavelength. And then we correct. Now we don't claim, <laughs> although I'd love to, but my but my my guys won't let me. Um, is that we don't claim to have absolute fluence compensation. What we claim is is that we got wavelength dependent fluence compensation. So what that means is that we can compensate for the variations that you have with wavelength. And the motivation for that is that that allows you to get clean spectroscopic identification. What it does doesn't mean is that we can get quantitation. Right, so we can't tell you the concentration of this. We can get a clean spectrum, but we can't get uh, absolute quantitation. Um, but I still think there's a, a, a chance to get to that to get to that stage. But anyway, the idea is you have the fixed object and you, so you use the field. So you do it over here. You do it over here. Right. And if you have blood pools around or, you know, scattering, you don't you don't have to assume that. So if you just go and just make your best model, because light does after a few millimeters, you do have a pretty good uh, model of diffusion, uh, then you can map back and, and get these uh, corrections. And again, spectroscopically, not not absolutely. Thanks very much, Matt. So the next question to you is from Eno. So he says there is no doubt why metallic exogenous contrast agents are quite attractive for photoacoustic imaging. And he is curious to hear your thoughts on the eventual clinical translation of such modalities, given that there seems to be insurmountable challenges on delivering meaningful enough concentrations to tumors, even in preclinical models. OK. Uh, 
That's a great question, and it's, it's, there's two parts to that question, <clears throat> one of which is a larger controversy, uh, which is about the uh, efficiency of nanoparticle delivery. And there's been uh, quite a bit of um, uh, argument, good scientific argument uh, in the literature about uh, the efficiency of nanoparticle deliveries. Uh, the guy, oh, I can picture him, I'm balking his name, at the University of Toronto, who uh, published about five years ago a controversial paper uh, talking about how the efficiencies are like a few percent. <laughs> when you actually go through the modeling, when you actually deliver uh, these nanoparticle systems, he was talking primarily about drug delivery, but it's the same mechanisms for, for contrast agents. Uh, it's pretty small. So that's still a big challenge for clinical. So that's the first part. The second part, uh, which is about metallic agents and all that. So we've gone completely away from that. We don't, we know, and we use gold nanorods and other things just to, <clears throat> For little test cases and, and little uh, preclinical uh, tests. But for clinical stuff, we're getting very much away from that and we're going towards um, uh, agents which are uh, based on nano emotions and some dyes. And the reason for that is, is uh, they're all FDA approved materials. They're all within FDA <clears throat> approved uh, agents already in other modalities. So that piece goes down. The second is is something I didn't say in my talk. I showed this one contrast age and image and they said it's cool. And I'll tell you about it later. What I forgot to tell you is why I had it in this talk on hybrid. It was in the talk because it's a hybrid agent. So it's not just a linear photoacoustic agent. It's an agent which uh, brings a piece from ultrasound and a piece from optics. The piece from optics is you have optical absorbers. So creating uh, the local absorption, which is a, a photoacoustic effect, but Instead of converting it linearly to heat around it, is as part of the agent, there's a little emulsion. It's the perfluorocarbon, which is used in uh, uh, clinical ultrasound contrast agents, but we put it in a liquid form. And with the heating, the liquid phase changes. It turns into a gas and rapidly expands. And so it increases and gets about three times, uh, three, excuse me, about two to three orders of magnitude uh, amplification of the photoacoustic effect. So what that does is it gets down to picomolar concentrations instead of nanomolar concentrations. So, uh, uh, and you don't need much light because it's nonlinear. You can work with sub millijoule per centimeter squares um, uh, fluences for activation. So uh, this is an approach uh, we're taking because I agree with you. The double problem you know, is the two problems that you have with photoacoustic contrast. One is the delivery, and that's a more global problem. But then the second is, is if you are only getting small concentrations of agents, is you you can't rely on the linear photoacoustic effect uh, at any kind of depth. And so we're trying not to. We're trying to use nonlinear mechanisms to amplify by a lot uh, what's in there. So that's a hybrid contrast agent is the approach, I think, uh, to do this. And uh, we're doing this, Stas Emelianoff at Georgia Tech's doing this. A few other groups are, are looking at this uh, kind of approach uh, as well. <clears throat> and I think that's where the field's gonna go, not the metal contrast agents, frankly. I think those be confined to um, preclinical imaging. Any other opinions from people out there? I was pretty strong on that, but that's all right. That's what I like to do, be a little controversial. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. So the next question is from Katrina. She says, thank you for the interesting lectures. And could you please go more into the details with the experimental conditions of your technique with, with particular regards to signal to noise ratio, acquisition time, probe power, motion artifacts, and so on? Who is that to? Uh, to anyone, either Ben or Matt. I can't, my scrolling is not working, so I can't read all the questions, but I, I think I got that. Um, uh, I mean, sure, read our papers. I mean, it's, it's you know, all that types of detail, that's exactly, especially in supplemental materials of the papers. I mean, you know, signal to noise ratios uh, are, are tough with depth. Uh, we don't do, uh, in standard mode, we don't do any signal averaging. Uh, we do everything shot to shot real time, but of course we then can accumulate things and signal average if we're trying, like for example, when we try to make very, very precise spectral estimates, we'll, 
we'll signal average, but we need to signal average with a motion compensation. So that's what we do. We motion compensate our uh, signal averaging. Um, but I think all these other things like that <clears throat> you're asking about is is just to read the read the literature to get it all because it's always in there. I mean, these guys, Ben, and you know all the people who publish in this field present all that kind of detail in the papers. Ben, you go. <laughs> Thanks very much for the answer. Um, the next question. Well, no, hold, hold, hold. Let Ben say something, please. I didn't say anything about experimental work. I'll have to pass the poll for that. Oh, OK. So I'll say <laughs> so, I, so I'll just say that, you know, you got to read the paper because there's a lot of those details. Really, you can only get by uh, uh, reading the papers and especially the supplemental material in the papers. Thank you, Matt. So the next question is also to you. If photoacoustics is used for controlled drug delivery, what are the requirements of the tissue where the drug is to be distributed? Requirements of the tissue? Yes. <laughs> Not quite sure I understand. I mean, if you're asking what kind of applications, <clears throat> we're looking at applications in the thyroid right now uh, as we speak. We're looking at peripheral nerve uh, delivery. We're looking at local anesthesia delivery. So it's a, in a lot of different organs. Our um, our li primary limitation is with our current system, we can go about two, maybe three centimeters. We don't go eight and ten centimeters deep. We go about two or three uh, uh, centimeters. Again, all real time, no signal averaging, but but it's only about two to three uh, centimeters deep. So that's the types of tissues. That's our biggest limitation. And so uh, the current ones we're looking at are uh, local anesthetics, uh, peripheral nerve blocks, and um, uh, thyroid doing um, ablation, whether by alcohol or RF uh, uh, or any other kind of delivery to the thyroid for localized treatment uh, uh, thyroid cancers. Um, so those are the big ones. You could do things endoscopically, you can do things intravascularly, excuse me. Um, but I, I don't know of uh, things beyond, um, you know, a few centimeter kinds of applications. Certainly for us, we're not, we're not doing anything more than that. Yeah, presumably uh, even more simply, obviously, uh, lungs and bones are a problem, right? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, your, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So it's it's ultrasound. I mean, I guess I'm just saying because I'm again, I'm an ultrasound person. We're leveraging off of ultrasound. So anything where ultrasound can deliver is what we're looking at, right? So yes, lungs, actually lung imaging has gotten very important in COVID time. Selling oh, lots of little handheld yeah. ultrasound machines uh, for, mm -hmm. for COVID because of just fluid retention. Um, but yes, lungs in general is not, and then bones in general, as we talked about trying to get through the skull, uh, we, we don't do that. But anywhere you would use traditional ultrasound, but doing deep liver. So for example, one we talk to people about, but we're not going to try is uh, uh, palliative therapies in the liver, which is a big business, um, and really could use uh, guidance for delivery. Uh, there because it allows you to do many, many more procedures with precise uh, guidance, but it's just too deep. It's blood filled and you got to get down, you know, seven to 10 centimeters. Did you so mention that, prostate, um, Matt? No, I did not mention prostate, but that's a good target too. Does so anything endoscopically, so, so um, uh, rectal probes, uh, which is used for prostate is a great delivery system. So anything that's endoscopic or peripheral and endoscopic, including intravascular, I think are great applications, but for us in the short term, thyroid, uh, peripheral nerve blocks and local uh, local anesthetics again up in the neck delivery is what we're looking at. Thank you, Matt. So the next question is to Ben. Photoacoustic signal signal generation is volumetric in nature. So. What problems we might come across if we only do two-dimensional photoacoustic imaging instead of a 3D photoacoustic imaging? OK, so I, I, I assume the question is asking if we use something like a linear array um, where we, we focus in a in a sort of slice through the image, can we get a can we get a good image? I mean, if, if you have obviously when you, if you had a perfect slice through the image and when you did the reconstruction, you bore in mind that the uh, the the um, the, the Green's function in real space is going to be three dimensional, then I think you could get a good image. I mean, in practice, 
you're never going to have a perfect slice. So you're always going to have these out of plane artifacts. There's always going to be stuff coming from uh, um, out of the slice you're looking at, which will appear as artifacts uh, in the image when you reconstruct the slice. So I guess that's the main that's the main issue. Thank you, Ben. So the next question is to Matt. So he asks, can we map near infrared spectroscopy measurements with ultrasound photoacoustic measurement if the depth profile is not exactly the same um <clears throat> that's kind of the so if you're asking I'm, I'm interpreting the question here if you're asking can you make spectroscopic measurements at different depths photoacoustically and still get the precision on the uh, on the spectroscopic measurement that's the question. Whether you ask that question or not, that's the question I'm going to answer. OK, so if you can do it at different uh, depths, yes, that was our motivation to get into fluence compensation, because uh, we've had a lot of conversations with Daniel Rosansky uh, about this and some others who have had a lot of experience um, uh, with small animals and some clinical imaging is their observation that you know as you go deeper in depth it becomes harder and harder to make spectroscopic measurements and you know as we thought about it and analyzed it yes that's the that's the fluent the, the wavelength dependent fluence variation is the thing that starts to dominate that after you go below maybe five even you know five seven millimeters i mean it's, you don't have to go very far before that starts to become significant so um that was sort of the motivation to go into fluence compensation so i'll put the big if in front you know, there's lots of techniques and they still have to be validated in real clinical circumstances. But if you can find a technique that can do the the uh, appropriate free, um, uh, wavelength dependent compensation, then yes, you can make uh, measurements which are independent of depth, spectroscopic measurements which are independent of depth. Um, but that's 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 a holy grail kind of question and, de and demonstration needed on that. Thank you so much, Matt. So the next question is again to you from Evelyn. So she says, in other areas uh, like radiation, uh, there are programs where you can simulate interaction of these waves uh, with particles or even tissues uh, from a library. Like there are simulation models available already. So. In photoacoustic imaging, are there any such simulation programs? Or is there a library where you have the wavelength distribution power and even the internal structure and you know you can simulate using the model and analyze the results? So I should pass that to Ben, then I'll come back and make a comment. But I mean, Ben's the expert on this. There's, so there's, there's, there's two aspects of photoacoustic, aren't there? There's the light modeling. Um, and then there's the acoustic modeling. So yes, there's lots of there's lots of uh, suites out there for doing both of those. Um, I mean, there's there's range of transfer equation models like MCX and other ones, Velo MC. There's diffusion approximation models like TOS plus plus and NeoFast. And then on the on the acoustic side, uh, there's K-Wave um, and and other um, other modeling uh, suites are available. Um, so, but I, in terms of any that combine the two inherently, no, I'm not sure there are, but they've been they're pretty easy to integrate because the two problems in photoacoustics are, are, are separate. So you can take the output of one and feed it into the other. So, yes, that's what I was, that's what we do. Yeah. And we use K Wave sometimes. <laughs> not a we, we, we We're addicted to another program, though, a commercial program where we have a relationship, so that's the one we use mostly. Thanks very much, Ben. So the next question is from David to Matt. Where can we read more about your motion tracking techniques? Oh, Lord. Um, well, all over the place. So we've been publishing our first paper and that was 1991. So uh, we've been doing that for a very, very long uh, time. The latest stuff, um, is a uh, IEEE access paper or whatever it's called. This one, it was the first online IEEE journal 
um, you know, exclusively online, IEEE Journal. I think it's called Access. In the last year or two, was sort of an update of where we are. Um, and uh, we've leveraged recently to try to make these things more real time. We've, we've, we've hybridized again, hybridized between our traditional approach, which is based on speckle tracking with uh, um, uh, computer vision approaches, which we stole from Google and others for doing face recognition. Uh, and we sort of hybridize these things to work uh, to work in real time or near real time. But the IEEE access article uh, is fine. And if uh, Martin sends me an email, I can give you uh, a semi infinite list <laughs> of these things. No, I'll just give you the latest ones you can look at in this. But this is this is absolute commercial standard uh, in ultrasound uh, and um, you're mostly in echocardiography in ultrasound, but it's absolutely standard stuff nowadays. So uh, I think that was the last question. So um, extraordinary performance uh, there, guys. Um, uh, maybe if I could just uh, address one thing that that Matt uh, touched on a couple of times: uh, the fluence correction. So you're you've done that by various methods, including this method of moving. Um, the source and and so on. Uh, is there a limit to the depth over which that um, that operates? And uh, obviously, it 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 depends on having uh, some absorber at some depth that you can you can work with, right? And extrapolate right. around. Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll ask the second part of that first, which is if you don't have a, an absorber, who cares? <laughs> Yeah, from yeah. A photo, good, good point, good point. Right, from a photoacoustic point of view. So that's what we do. So we do it from all absorbers. And and uh, one trick that we do is if we have absorbers close to each other, then we combine them to get, you know, a higher mm -hmm. signal to noise ratio. But that's the biggest limit. By far the biggest limit is signal to noise ratio. Because right. you have to be able to tell the difference between what you get at these different positions. You know, so it's like a differential signal effectively. So it's another, um, you know, high pass filter, spatial high pass filter or whatever way you want to think of it uh, on the processing, which, of course, amplifies noise. So I think that's the biggest limit is uh, signal to noise ratio. Um, and I think the way we're going to handle it, we've handled it so far, at least in animal models, is we do look for little clusters of um, absorbers. And then we'll do this motion tracking and we'll integrate over 100 frames or something to get the signal to noise ratio. Now, it's still presenting real time images, but we'll do the, the fluence compensation maybe over 100 frames because signal to noise ratio is the big, at least for us, has been the biggest issue in doing this. Yeah, I guess where I was getting at with the defined absorber was something where you know the absorption of, like, like arterial blood, for example. No, don't need it. Don't need it at all. That's, that's the good part of this trick. As long as it's common, right? right as long to all as it's of common, them. you're doing yeah. the spatial. You're doing the spatial part. You're not trying to differentiate one wavelength from another wavelength. All you're using is the spatial variance. So I said it's like a derivative, spatial derivative that you're using, and that amplifies noise. So that's that's our biggest. That's our biggest issue. We don't have to know the absorb. We do not have to know the um, okay. spectrum of the absorber. Right. And and does it add much time doing this extra scanning, or are you doing that anyway? We're doing that anyway. So right now, if we have sufficient signal to noise, we can do it frame to frame. But um, uh, you know, in real life, we won't have sufficient signal to noise. So we'll have to do some kind of uh, averaging, and we have to be smart about that. Um, but if we have big signals, yeah, if we see big signal, we can do it real time. If we do it frame to frame. Um, thank goodness for GPU arrays. <laughs> yeah, they're they're getting put to good use and. Um, a final point, you you reference this a lot because you come from the, the, the ultrasound area, but in OCT and photoacoustics, so much has been learned from, from the um, traditional ultrasound um, imaging technologies, including elastography and so on, that come out maybe 10 or 20 years later uh, in these technologies. So, uh, you know, it's great to have all that learning experience there. Um, I think we should wrap it up there. This has been an extraordinary session. Uh, thanks to everybody who contributed, Matt and Ben, who you see online there, uh, Sarah and Paul, 
uh, made excellent contributions earlier. Uh, the team in the background who've been looking after the uh, technical part, Aaron uh, in particular, and Seren, and then people asking questions, Saria, uh, Seren, Aidan. Thank you all for your contributions. It's, uh, it's really been a wonderful thing and clearly the students appreciated it. They have had many, many questions. Uh, we are not able to give you a nice uh, round of applause really uh, with this system, but people can give us their, um, can leave their comments uh, as they, many of them have done uh, of their appreciation and so on in the comment box. So. Um, Thank you guys uh, so much. Um, I know it's very early days in Seattle and, and getting later further east. Uh, we have people from five different continents at least asking questions. So uh, <laughs> some of them must be in the middle of the night. So so thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm going to sign off. Thanks all. Bye bye from I Ireland. OK, and thank you, Aaron, for helping me with my uh, Microsoft challenges. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs>